Aoife and Kristin's presentation this afternoon is titled Learning Place, and we'll be exploring the work of David and Mary Med. The Meds, by way of introduction, were the influential designers of a number of primary schools in post-war England. As was noted in The Guardian's obituary of David Med in 2009, quote, their formidable partnership became the engine room of intelligent innovation in post-war school building. So I think some of the questions that were raised by the first session about the ways in which architecture might shape or might constrain uh, experiences of education are things that we'll be returning to um, at this point. I'm Aoife and this is my teaching partner, Christine. Um, and as Sam has mentioned, we co-lead a unit together in Kingston School of Arts Architecture Department with Mary, our head of department is here, Mary Johnston. And we also practice and research together. So both uh, qualified architects and have some experience within the field of education and early years provision. And more recently, um, in this territory of uh, exploratory practices with uh, early years, alternative methods, and thinking about agency for children. And, and this is really what the Whitechapel Residency was about, which has led us to this point. Um, so, to start, uh, the architecture of David and Mary Med. The Med's work originated in the golden post-war period in England, which was a time of optimism and experimentation, when governments increased their commitment to the building or renewal of democracies, through public schooling. And democracy really is a strand that we're very interested in, in terms of urban design and in terms of architecture and alternative pedagogies. So these fertile conditions produced a body of work described as a humane functionalism that greatly influenced subsequent thinking regarding design for education in the UK. In this talk, the scene from which the Med's work emerged will be set initially. And then we will move into discussing its enduring value as a model both for collaborative research and design in terms of its radical ideas spatially and pedagogically and in terms of the tangible architectural heritage it has left with us. And we've had the fortune with our students who were studying the topic of alternative pedagogies uh, to visit a couple of the med schools, such as Burley, uh, just outside uh, nor northern London, um, and seeing these in action, albeit in 2018-19, rather than when, the, when they were first constructed. So David and Mary Med met while working for Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire Council's architecture department. Having studied in the AA in the early 20th century, during an exciting moment in the evolution of architectural education and thinking. So during these interwar years, the AA as a school was central in radical thinking and debate around architecture in the UK. It was also simultaneously influenced by the Bauhaus and by Gropius's principles of a total architecture where functionalism, social purpose and cooperative endeavour came together. In 1930s Europe, there were few examples of fresh architectural thinking available for study or for visiting. And so Mary travelled to Scandinavia to research new public architecture and was influenced greatly by the work she saw and studied there, in particular in Sweden. And we are currently in the architecture department in the throes of taking our students on various field trips. Mary is about to depart to Ghana with hers on Sunday. And the value of these research trips and the way that they can impress on the kind of direction that architectural thinking takes uh, can't be understated. So having seen Mary's sketchbooks in the Institute of Education archives, we, we can see how this was all very, very influential in, in building her position on architecture. So the Meds found themselves operating in the climate of post-war bomb-damaged Britain with the significantly damaged urban fabric and it was urgently in need of reconstruction. This was a time of austerity with limited materials, rationing and labour shortages after the war. Parallels have been drawn with present day austerity. However, it was also a time of optimism, as I mentioned, of radical thinking and of experimentation 
and the city was being reconstructed in some house, so there was a degree of urgency. There's a view here of London in its sort of semi-devastated state. In parallel, the Abercrombie slum clearances were making way for a new uh, categorisation or a zoning of ur which made way for urban development. And that was forming the background beat of the drum to this time as well. And this was an important social and historical chapter in the urban history of the late 1940s, particularly in London. Ambitious large-scale public projects, such as the Festival of Britain, which opened in 1951 on the South Bank in London, on the Thames, and its parallel Lansbury Lawrence uh, live architecture exhibition. This is the example here of some of the propaganda material which spoke about the neighbourhood in Poplar that was uh, produced basically as a live expo in parallel with the Festival of Britain. And this included ideas around prototype new housing, education and other social functions in the East End of London. These were effectively live demonstrations of how a better environment could be planned and designed. The wave of architectural experimentation was coupled with some large infrastructural changes that scarred the largely Victorian fabric of the city. So what the war hadn't decimated, the engineers in the late 50s into the 60s sought to resolve. And, um, this image here shows the bricklayer's arms fly over in South East London. The area around Elephant and Castle, which is currently being wholesale redeveloped, and at that time, which was also largely redeveloped, providing multiple high-density new housing blocks, some of which you can see under construction here, such as the Haygate Estate. Um, the Haygate provided for a population of over 3,000 people, and with it came an associated need for new education buildings. The Med's radical approach and ideas were born at home. They were influenced from Europe, and further afield, where, for example, couples such as Charles and Ray Eames in the US left an indelible imprint on the design environment of the 50s. As Peter Smithson said, by a few chairs and a house, they changed everything. Here is a tableau of the toy and plywood children's furniture set up in the Eames studio. Their studio was a place with a climate of collaborative experimentation and very influential still today. The Smithsons uh, designed back in the UK the Hunstanton School in 1949, which we see here, in a competition for secondary post-war schools, which reflected the. Whoops, I lost my. I'll still be hard, I think. Uh, which reflected the emerging international modernist aesthetic in British terms and culture, and for a regional British audience. Thus began a prolific area from 1950 to 70, when the school's building program that ensued, which has been described as a remarkable attempt to put the fullest possible interpretation of the modern movement into effect, with buildings that were of real benefit to society. And although they made no great architectural reputations, the meds, after all, are relatively unknown, um, or produced masterpieces in a conventional sense, on Stanton is bit different. This wave of building was very influential. The beginning of the 20th century, um, the time when Mary Crawley and David Med were born, was another era of rethinking education and its role in building a more democratic society. Um, pioneering new concepts in early childhood education, um, leading figures of that were um, Maria Montessori, um, uh, Rachel and Margaret McMillan, um, uh, Susan Isaac. Uh, the image here shows the uh, Casa dei Bambini uh, uh, developed by uh, Maria Montessori in Rome. And it also pioneered radical experiments in democratic, uh, child-centered teaching um, spearheaded by um, A.S. Neal with the opening of the um, Summerhill Democratic School in uh, Suffolk. Um, and uh, this image just shows that sort of free spirit under which the school was run. The, f 
their family backgrounds, Mar Mary's and David's, were very progressive, and um, the above uh, influences were very present in their childhoods uh, and education and have greatly influenced uh, their professional uh, work. Both were attending uh, progressive schools. Mary uh, went to Beedales, uh, which was regarded as one of, uh, of the most progressive uh, schools in Europe. Mary's father, Robert Crawley, was a key figure in an international movement to establish school hygiene uh, and a compulsory medical inspection service in elementary schools. He had a keen interest in the welfare and education of uh, uh, children and he pioneered the uh, open air school uh, movement and their introduction uh, in the UK. He was also in, uh, a colleague of Margaret Macmillan at the time. Both uh, Mary and David joined the architect's department of Hertfordshire Council, County Council directly after the war. Hertfordshire, under the leading influence of Stuart Johnson, uh, Marshall was pioneering in, design, in the design and production of prefabricated school buildings. Um, prefabrication, a solution which deemed best uh, to answer the needs to construct uh, a large number of new schools for an exploding population after the war, using fast building methods and working with tightly rationed materials and budgets. So the traditional methods of building schools, typically in brick, was far too slow to, uh, to um, tackle that task. Time pressure required working with an existing system at the beginning, although the architects wouldn't have wanted to, but um, that was the reality. The uh, eight feet uh, and three inches system, um, consisting of standardized prefabricated steel components manufactured by Hills and Company, uh, was selected. But the system had to be broken up into a kit of parts, a concept of prefabrication, not by unit of structure, but by components, to make the design responsible to site and program. David Matt was very influential in the uh, side of technical developments on this. So this was a revolutionary use of prefabrication and the Hertfordshire schools gained nationwide influence and international uh, recognition and fame. The delicate metal structure was uh, exposed internally and together with the large areas of glazing generated a lightness and spirit which was very different from the Victorian brick schools. Every component in the building was specially designed up to the light fittings. Pevsner described the buildings as elegant and carefully considered into the smallest detail. So here, early examples of uh, Essendon, and um, that was the interior, and this is uh, uh, the view uh, from, from outside. And Burley uh, Primary School in Chesson, the one we visited with the students, were the first examples um, built after the war. The two main architectural and educational influences shaping the design of the early Hertfordshire schools were uh, the Henry Morris Cambridgeshire Community Village Colleges, which were led by the vision that the college would be closely intertwined with the daily lives of the community it served, and that the education would not be an escape from reality, but an enrichment and transformation of it. So, this slide and the previous one uh, are showing Impington uh, Village College, designed by Walter Gropius and Maxwell Fry in 1939. The second significant influence, architectural influence, were the open-air schools. They were part of an international movement uh, starting at the beginning of the century, uh, initially to tackle the spread of infectious diseases like tuberculosis in overcrowded city environments, but also recognizing the role of nature and the outdoor world in the development of children and its potential for observation and discovery focusing on the equilibrium between head, hands, and heart. 
So these two slides were from the Ecole de plein air de Seren, designed by Eugene Baudouin et Marcel Lowe and in collaboration with Jean Prouvé. The early Hertfordshire schools didn't support progressive teaching practices through architecture and followed the traditional layout with self-contained classrooms, yet they've established what would become the guiding principles for its child-centered school design in the following decades. Mary Mad, having had a firm background in progressive educational practices, was instrumental in developing a set of requirements which was given to the architects as a brief. The schools had to be broken up and not look industrial. Children should be able to see out of windows. The main entrance of the school should be used by children as well as adults. No constricting briefs or plan types were given. The architectural responses developed from this brief included a design fitting the size of the children, low window sills for children to see out, and lightweight furniture, integration of the outdoor space for learning um, in, the, in the form of external courtyards, integration of the decorative arts in the design of schools for the stimulation of the intellectual development. The most influential achievement of the Mets uh, working under the architect and building branch in the Ministry of Education, uh, where they moved in 1949, was the development of a new democratic topology for education, termed an, an environment or a landscape of planned opportunities, providing a variety of different, flexible, connected spaces designed with the intention to support the constantly evolving best practices in teaching. This model stopped the hegemony of traditional classroom corridor model and laid a path for an education uh, directed towards the future. Key to the development of this model was the visit to Crow Island School in Vinetka, Illinois, um, built in 1940, and their visit was in 1959. Um, the school was built, uh, uh, designed by Perkins, Wheeler and Will in collaboration with um, Ilya Sarinen. Working in the development group of the architects and building branch, which placed research and innovation in school building in relation to pedagogy at its height, allowed them time for design studies and for investigation. Travel and study visits were an instrumental tool for the Mets for gathering new experiences and developing their own work. The lesson they learned from Crow Island School, pictured here, was the combination of a, vari a variety of different spaces, conventional teaching spaces and workshop sections, providing space for practical and creative work. So you see here in that diagram, the square space is the conventional um, teaching space, and that sort of L-shaped extension uh, is the area for the practical work. That practic practical work was considered um, um, uh, 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 an integral uh, component of the, of the teaching. But they also um, found a domestic and a homely character of the environment, featuring a library, a sitting room, with a bed and a fireplace and a cooking area in the school. After this visit, the Mets developed their five ingredients uh, for design and primary school planning, which from then onwards were applied on all developments by the A, B and B, influenced by the Mets approach. They were first realized in the design for the Finmer Village School in Oxfordshire pictured here. The Mets tirelessly continued their approach of combining research and testing it in practice. Every new school they built was an investigation into another topic. The next school would be built upon the findings from building the previous one. This evolving knowledge was disseminated through the building bulletins, a documentation following each completed school, evaluating its achievements and making it available to local authorities across the country. So, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on 
Evelyn Lowe. Yeah. So Evelyn Lowe Primary School in South London, so adjacent to Elephant and Castle, took the village school typology into an urban setting. It was designed after the Finmere School that Christine just showed. And Finmere had set the course of primary design for the next decades. Finmere was deemed research in practice and it allowed the analysis of the ingredients of primary education. It was understood amongst designers, policy makers and educators alike that the needs of parents and children in a dense urban environment were very much the same as those that one would meet in a village. So even Lowe was described by David Mead as the turning of an institutional block into a small village that a child can wander around without being aware of the whole. So an intimacy and a level of comfort in scale. Evelyn Lowe was built on the site of a World War II bomb-damaged two-story school that had to be demolished. The school itself appeared in its new format as a rather pedestrian and perhaps ordinary offering from the exterior. This approach resonated with the desire to create a modest and humanist architecture not focused on architectural showmanship. That should be a vehicle for education instead. Even in low employed techniques, such as the use of low fences and single story arrangement, which recalls the scale of a home environment. And these are all tools that were to set the children at ease and also to draw parents and families into the site, including for out of hours use of the building, thus aiming to bridge the gap between the world outside and the inner life of the school. The five ingredients established at Finmere, that Christine mentioned, were present also at Evelyn Lowe. The home base, the particular bays, the covered area or veranda, the general work area and the enclosed room. This image is taken from Catherine Burke of Cambridge University's book around Mary Med, A Life in Education, it's called. And we should take this moment to thank Cathy for her incredible contribution to our understanding of the work of this pair. She was intending to be here, but I think the train's flooding of lines have prevented her. So thank you, Cathy. The whole of the school at Evelyn Low turned into the inner courtyard so you were not aware of being surrounded by the busy roads or traffic of this redeveloped, very dense, intense urban area. The flow from external to internal spaces was a critical part of the project also, as you can see from the plan layout here. With a flexibility inherent and easy movement for children and access to nature and the elements. Still captured from a very interesting documentary titled The Expanding the Classroom, which was made by the BBC in 1969 and took, um, took this school as a case study as well. They're shown here to communicate the life of the school's interior and illustrate the principle of built-in variety and the whole school environment, which was critical to the Med's approach at this time. The integration of the arts was a key principle of the MEDS model as a means to growth and intellectual development, not simply in support of core curriculum. With the use, for example, of triggers, a prepared landscape for learning was set up, together with expert methods being demonstrated. Sketching and drawing was considered a way of investigating and researching, both within the school and out in the field. They did a lot of trips as well as communicating and producing imaginative work. Children could pursue art or making activities individually or in small groups, and the building and its spaces, which ranged in scale and provided opportunities for this kind of quiet, reflective individual work, nooks and crannies, as David called them, or for more collaborative, collective learning with adults or without. The meticulous care which David took in designing the interior from attending to colour, detail and design around the proposed activities and inhabitation is visible in some of the drawings shown here. Uh, these are taken from the Institute of Education archives and describe the close-up level of detail that he interrogated and there are reams of these drawings. They're quite incredible, folded, beautiful old prints with watercolour and Pantone rendering. 
And you can see that he was really invested in a very detailed level of interrogation of these proposals. The piano in the music bay, for example, was considered as a common activity and central to the life of the school community. There was a conscious move to try to remove the standard model in favour of a flexible, open version, as set out in the Plowden report. And there's a previous image I'll just go back to, which shows some tests that were carried out in the evolution of this project in its first iterations of different models being applied to the site and ultimately dismissed in favour of, of the MEDS approach, which is illustrated at the bottom. Um, the structure of the classes and the teacher-pupil ratio at Evelyn Lowe was based on the same ratio as the Inner London Education Authority, with 14 children to one teacher. Oops, sorry. Students of pedagogy were brought in to assist as well as improve the ratios, and staff worked closely as a team, sharing preparation, setting up of activities, which was done very carefully in a very considered way and being able to support the children collectively without overwhelming their own individual kind of autodidactic roles. It was a collaborative teaching model that really required very good teamwork. And some of the teachers described it in the documentary as quite demanding and exhausting, but ultimately very rewarding. The documentary asked the question whether this was actually an example of anarchy in action in the classroom. It had been observed that, to the outsider, uh, the situation looked like there was little formal learning going on. But the teachers in the documentary were quick to respond that the basis of all learning is interest and that it was critical to understand that. And that you could easily observe that there is purpose in everything that the children are doing in, in the filmed snaps and images taken from the site in use. Part of the research and careful observation that fed into this method was based on establishing how much freedom children could take without feeling fear and building this into the design. So ultimately, and sadly, this great wave of work came to an end with the Im input of an individual named Maggie Thatcher, who the term a profession brought to heal, yes. <laughs> Um, a profession brought to heel uh, was, yes, how she approached teaching and education and the, the consequences that she had for, for that territory. So subsequent shifts in government, uh, approach and ambition and a changing social and economic context ended the golden era that we've described. Maggie Thatcher was appointed Minister of Education from 1970 she is, to 1974, during which time she clashed with the educational establishment and they saw her as an invader or an outsider who had little understanding or knowledge of what she was talking about. During those four years, she didn't implement much change, but as soon as she had the opportunity in power as prime minister, she changed everything and a new regime began in education in the UK. Ultimately, this saw teachers lose control. There was a shift away from progressive child-centred education models to a more military-style approach to education with far less flexibility and freedom. The later introduction of the national curriculum in 1988 compounded the problem and resulted architecturally in a locking down spatially and a return to the former hegemonic classroom model that the Plowden era schools had attempted to move away from. What distinguished the work of Mary and David Mead was the insistence that education and architecture in school design could not be separated, and that only a process of careful and patient observation of children and teachers in school, schools would lead to a proper understanding of this relationship and could guarantee an architecture which supports the constantly evolving best practices in teaching and the future of education. The development of a democratic architectural model for education benefited the entire nation and gained worldwide influence, confirming their role as leading agents 
in building a more democratic society, society through education. Today's context of austerity, shrinking budgets for education, I keep the image of Maggie Thatcher up for a bit longer, and uh, tightening regulations around school building in combination with a neoliberal agenda for education, focusing on results, ratings, and increasing competition between schools provides a severe threat to the progressive child-centered values in education developed over the last century. Fortunately, democratic practices in education don't rely on buildings. But as the work of the MEDS and the AAB uh, architects and building branch, excuse me, um, demonstrates, they can hugely help to facilitate its development and if centrally managed, its implementation at a large scale. However, buildings don't guarantee uh, progressive teaching practices. Te teachers need to be shown um, how to use the potentials built into the spaces um, to its full capacity. And uh, maybe we can extend on this um, in the discussion later on, um, responding to Anna's earlier comment. Um, so developing the practices of democratic education has always relied on the leadership of far-sighted individuals and educators. And a lot of them were either contemporaries of the Mets, A.S. Neal, Alexander Bloom, Philip Tugut, uh, Roland uh, Megan, just to name a few, or directly or indirectly influencing their work at different stages in their lives. Um, again, naming here uh, Maria Montessori, the Macmillan sisters, and John Dewey. Currently, democrat uh, democratic practices in education in the UK um, have largely reverted to the independent and private sector, and with that are accessible only for those who can afford to pay for it. The legendary democratic Summerhill School and here is uh, an image of, the, of their weekly school assemblies, has celebrated its centenary last year. However, it is constantly battling the threat of being closed down. The recent opening of the Red House Plymouth School of Creative Arts in 2015, um, a building designed by the London-based architectural practice Fielding uh, Clegg Bradley, uh, a mainstream state all through school for ages 3 to 16 uh, gives hope. Their vision has grown out of an established art school ethos in response to the serious erosion of the arts and creativity in schools and focuses on learning through making, practice and participation and building strong links with the community. The UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, the first comprehensive human, right, human rights treaty on children, states that children have the right to express their views in all matters affecting the child, and that, their views, and that the views of children should be given due weight. And this involves the right to be consulted on their environment. Our invitation to this conference was based on a project we did in collaboration with the Whitechapel Gallery this summer called A Seat at the Table, which was about improving existing learning environments. The key aim of the project was to give a voice to the children and lending them agency and ownership over their learning environments. In our work as architects and educators, we'll strive to continue the investigations into spaces of learning with children. We've begun and will help bringing to light the unmatched legacies of the Mets, which is an incredible inspiration for us. Thank you. Aoife, Christian, thank you so much. Um, you've opened out so many questions, and I think there are a number of ways that we could take this. Um, it's getting close to five o'clock already. Um, so I think before I ask any questions, I wanted to know if there were any burning questions from the audience. We have roaming mics. So please do put your hand up if there are. Yes, just at the back here. Just one second. 
just wondered if it's possible to hear a little bit more about the research process itself. You talk about the, uh, you know, the kind of action research type approach. Uh, that the meds undertook. Yeah. 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 Well, so um, on the working under the architects and building branch from 1949 onwards, um, um, in the development group, um, their work. Uh, was or the focus of the work was was based on this approach of uh, research and then testing it in practice and so each school they would build uh, uh, was investigating one specific topic um, they thought needed attention so for instance um, in um, it, they would sort of measured the, body, the bodies of children um, before they designed Amersham um, School, I believe it was. Um, so the survey of children's uh, bodies and anthropomorphical data uh, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't available, wasn't carried out uh, to, that, to that sort of level of um, maybe precision um, and detail before. So, uh, so they did that and then the development of, of, of furniture uh, was based on on those on those uh, uh, data, um, and it was put in relation. Uh, the body of the children was put in relation to all aspects of the design, like sort of the heights of the window sills, the heights of uh, tables, uh, uh, working counters, uh, the height of the mounting height of door handles, uh, etc. Um, and now that so. Another, another school would look at uh, the, 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 the typology of uh, village schools, so that was Fenmer. So topics kind of uh, came up, were discussed and agreed um, to be investigated within, within the development group. And uh, then those studies were, 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 were carried out and the research about the design of a new school and then eventually uh, tested in, in practice and then afterwards uh, developed, uh, uh, sorry, evaluated by documenting um, the findings and, um, and then the research was disseminated by, by means of these building bulletins um, nationwide and would then sort of re-influence uh, uh, local authorities building schools. Um, so it was an incredible process, careful process. Um, it was also very kind of radical in the sense that on the design team were architects, <laughs> educationalists, psychologists, people from various disciplines, historians and so on. And so collectively they were debating what direction to take, take the work. And even, for example, in Evelyn Lowe, so th they would cast the net quite wide and do a lot of visits. So when a principal was being earmarked to head up a new school, they would spend up to a year, I think it was, in, in the role in preparation of stepping into the school, whilst the school was perhaps under construction, researching other amazing examples in the field, which is a luxury that we just can't quite imagine now. And at Evelyn Lowe, there was a collaboration with uh, an architect who looked after the landscape elements of the design. So the sand pits, the water, the different decks, which provided different levels that were all tuned very much to the children's heights. And in preparing himself to respond in design terms to the brief, he set about a series of, I think it was 10 visits to schools that were considered kind of cutting edge in those terms to... Um, be fully briefed and, and abreast of what was happening at the time. So there was a huge investment into the process before they actually mm. executed anything. And, and just to maybe add, because it's, 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 it's important to mention, they learned that process of observation from Crow Island School. Um, uh, so with the development of Crow Island School um, sort of entailed this, uh, I think, uh, process of observation which took four months. Um, the architects going into various places and observing teachers and children in action. You noted at some point that 
I don't know if the school was criticized for the appearance of anarchy mm. that it seemed to be engendering, that these spaces seemed to be fostering. I was curious to know a little bit more about what the contemporary responses were to the meds schools, and also, I mean, your, your own reflections on the ways in which these spaces can shape these kinds of behaviors or, or habits. Well, for example, maybe if I start... In yeah, the just in the case of Evelyn Lowe, there has been a recent wave of work done in the last decade, which we would say works absolutely counter to the intention, sadly, of, of the meds. And with the kind of pinning down of the curriculum that started to happen gradually after the end of the golden era, elements such as the, the freedom in the plan or the kind of openness in the plan, the flexibility, the big sliding modernist kind of doors and so on, all became kind of fixed and locked down and um, even the, the buildings themselves started to alter and respond to the changing kind of context in terms of views of how education should be delivered in a primary context. Um, yeah, is it, is it worthwhile mentioning um, sort of recent developments abroad in, in, in relation to that? Um, so I was reviewing an exhibition which was held at the AEDIS uh, Architecture Forum in Berlin uh, this, this summer. They've, uh, they've exhibited 12 contemporary examples of school buildings across Europe. And only... Although I think generally schools have increased in building relationships with the communities, providing facilities which could be used by the entire community, uh, such as theatres, uh, sports facilities, libraries, etc. And um, in a way, well, in that way, sort of made more open um, and integrated with the with the environment of the cities. However, only in a few, I would say, maybe three examples, there was a critique built in maybe about the traditional classroom model. So the majority of them would still show the traditional classroom layout with corridors, etc., and an institutional look of them prevailed, um, sadly. Um, Three, three examples, one in Vienna by PGA, PP, uh, PPAG Architects, the Bildung, Bildungscampus, Sonnenwendviertel. Um, maybe that example seemed to be most progressive in and reflective of the Mets approach, offering this landscape uh, of, 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 of spaces supporting cross-project teaching, cross-age teaching, teaching in smaller groups, wider groups, and all, all with a sort of a level of inf spatial informality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is, I, you, one of the examples you gave was the Red House School mm -hmm. in Plymouth, and I visited there three or four years ago, and one of the striking elements in the design of that building or in the ways in which the curriculum is being shaped is that local organizations are also being hosted within the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Different artist collectives from within the city. And it seemed to create an extremely different dynamic yeah. to me, just having artists, having musicians, sitting quite close proximity to the canteen, to the assembly hall, and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah. It's an incredibly rich example, and it's in an area, I think, that suffers from extreme social deprivation, so it is kind of evidence of what can be achieved, and within the kind of relative constraints, they mounted a battle, I think, against the kind of standard response um, and managed to push through um, this quite incredible alternative model, which I think does give us some mm -hmm. glimmers of hope, which... Perhaps tellingly, the, the head teacher at that time anyway, Andrew Brewerton, Still is, yeah. had been at Dartington before. Yes. So I think there is a kind of a genealogy of some of these radical practices yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, and I think it kind of references um, the... Um, the community village colleges um, and that vision that education is, 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 is not, not, not distinct from um, the reality and the daily lives, but it's kind of integral to it. So I think the links with, with, with those local organizations, uh, the Red House School is, is, is building, whether that is uh, uh, dining, uh, lunchtime dining, with 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 just people 
from, um, um, from the city. Um, and there was an image where uh, one of the uh, boys served, I think, surf, served, served some lunch, and, um, and then they have sports teams reading to the children and <laughs> training in the school, so building, building those kind of synergies and sort of making, making that sort of learning that transition between learning, learning and, and the, the sort of the daily lives is really strong in that project and great, yeah. Other questions? Tom. Thank you so much for this uh, talk um, and the work. Um, I, was, I was wondering, because I'm, I'm, I'm confronted with this problem as well as kind of preparing an, an exhibition on educational architectures and spaces, uh, how how the how a politics of representation or the the question of visualizing the school and the child and the child uh, comes comes into play. You have been you have shown uh, a lot of images showing children uh, inside and outside the buildings. These uh, I think I think it is necessary to attend very closely to the very function of these images when they were done originally and how they. Are how they're used uh, in, uh, in the presentation of a, of, a, of a project, which I, as I understood, uh, is very much about um, involving uh, the children in a, in a different way in, in, um, in, the, in the process. And how much of a consent is being, uh, I mean, done or given uh, in, uh, for example, in, uh, with, with, uh, his, with historical, Photographs of, of these of these uh, of these uh, situations and of contemporary ones. So, isn't it also about I mean the way in which a project such as this, which is great, is being is being uh, displayed, <laughs> is being uh, uh, brought to a public? Is uh, uh, is it isn't it necessary also to 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 reflect on the visual uh, and other elements of representation in play here? I mean, who is I mean, are these are the children actually? Uh, have they consent? Is there anyone? I mean, is, is nobody here uh, of them? And we are speaking about these images. Mm -hmm. or some Gracious maybe. Gentlemen, but, yeah. uh, but, it's, but, but this, I, I just, this is a very general question, but which I'm also uh, trying to uh, cope. I mean, trying to mm -hmm. get a solution for because not showing the images is probably also not a solution. But it's, but maybe I mean they need to be I mean productively redacted in some way. I think. I mean it's. Uh, oh. I mean, I think just to um, tap into this, I think it's not just a matter of representation, but actually how, what are the built-in affordances within uh, architecture that recognize children as constitutive members and how, actually, so how do we need to understand architecture and how does it need to, yeah, I mean, see, I, here I see pictures of children making chairs and is this what, is this what, um, an affordance for children and being sort of uh, members who participate in the making of these structures. And I think another aspect that hasn't been touched upon is, uh, for instance, information uh, architecture, so software also. So I think the understanding of architecture and education, not only as a built environment, but um, I think policy has been addressed, but also, I don't know, information uh, architecture or what what... Uh, definition of architecture are we working with and how can we think of it in terms of agency from the perspective of children? I have a relatively short answer, I think, Tom, to, to, to your question. Um, a question I was uh, asking myself when preparing this presentation. Um, looking at these contemporary examples, I mean, historic examples, we, 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 we were kind of limited to basically the, the documentation which, which was available. So the, luckily um, for uh, the contemporary uh, examples, and I was planning to showcase a few more, so I was going through a few schools and the kind of the documentation about them. So I didn't find the architectural photographs doing, doing justice to, uh, to the concept uh, of the school to the pedagogical, uh, or maybe the sort of division, the pedagogical concept and this kind of division of uh, uh, education, educational practices, I found films, uh, 
yeah. filming the school in action to be a much more successful medium for communicating uh, the, the, the life of the school. So uh, uh, some of the Red House school photographs were actually stills from a film. The tendency in, in architectural photography to focus on the built form rather than on its use and on its inhabitants in connection with the architecture is uh, still very prevalent, even in documenting school buildings. So it's, I think this is definitely an interesting um, territory to, mm -hmm. to kind of go into and, and try shaking it up Absolutely. a bit. Absolutely. I think the films capture and convey the atmosphere of kind of quiet industriousness way more powerfully than any stills, particularly those that are commonly used within the kind of architecture profession, which tend to be the cooler kind of more controlled versions. And actually the truth of the story is all about this extremely lively situation where the children are responding so readily to these prepared environments and, you know, using the triggers and busily carrying about their activities um, in a super industrious way, as I say, sorry. Please. It's this example of this um, of the New Zealand artist Darcy Lang, who in the 1970s uh, did observational documentaries in uh, British uh, schools, and uh, what he was doing, he was he was uh, with the consent of the of the students and the teachers, he was filming the uh, the class in action an hour, and then another hour was spent on uh, on on showing the showing the film to the students and. They were they were uh, kind of they were discussing and feedbacking on the material without any of the teachers present, and then there were mm -hmm. interviews being done. So, so this, I mean, I think the material produced in, I mean, whenever it is still possible to produce this kind of material, should uh, be treated or maybe could be treated in a way that uh, that allows uh, those being documented, those being observed, to respond to it. I mean, it's. Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, on the Whitechapel project this spring, uh, we collaborated with a very lovely photographer who approached the task of being in attendance at each of those weekly workshop sessions in a way that set the children at ease to the extent that none of them were performing for the camera. They had all given their consent to being documented. And um, because they were also participating in every stage and shaping the project with us, and were key when we brought the project to the gallery to show it off and bring families in and friends and teachers and so on, the community. Um, they had this great sense of pride. We did a sort of um, an exchange where they were teaching their parents how to saw and how to kind of nail, hammer things together and so on. And um, they were so proud of it. But their relationship to the camera was very interesting. It evolved very rapidly partly due to the ability of that individual who was an arts educator himself. And I think there is an incredible amount of uh, sensitivity and very appropriate kind of way of handling these situations present amongst, um, I think, gallery education people and arts education people and so on. Um, and maybe some of these resources are, could be tapped into a lot more, in a sense, to convey the truth of, of the story. And Other questions? Just at the back. Thanks, I thought that was very interesting. <clears throat> Have there been any studies to identify and quantify the educational benefits of this approach as opposed to a more traditional approach? I and mean, at the time, you said a lot of this was going on between 50 and 70 when there were a lot of traditional brick-built schools. And I think you also said some of these more open schools has become more locked down with time. So again, there were two opportunities there for doing such a comparative study. Has any of this been done? I don't know whether that's actually possible um, if you're not measuring um, against a, a system as in existence right now. Um, but the fair uh, question, uh, sorry, sorry, the fair answer to the question is no, I don't know. But there is an, a very beautiful quote from uh, from A. S. Neil, the the guy who set up uh, Summer Hill and that democratic, sort of leading democratic school example, probably worldwide, he was saying, um, I have my school uh, bringing about rather a happy street sweeper 
than an unhappy prime minister. That just leaves me to um, ask you to join me in thanking Ephraim and Christine for the presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.